making sense of EU. Welcome to Making Sense of EU, a podcast where scientific research sheds light on the pressing issues of EU affairs. Making Sense of EU is brought to you by the Institut de Toutes Européennes of the Université Libre de Bruxelles. This series on the challenges of liberal democracy in the EU is a product of the Horizon Europe research project Red Spinel and is co-funded by the European Union. My name is Maria Isabel Solevila and I am your host. Humans love stories. Our common understanding about who we are, about the other and about our societies comes in great part from the stories we tell ourselves. But those narratives do not only contribute to our culture and our values, they can also become toxic and be used to manipulate, disinform and justify destruction. In a context of information disorder and polarization, with the impact this has on society and democracy, making sense on how disinformation, narratives and even silence shape our democracies is key. I'm very happy to have with us today two special guests to help us out figure it out. Maximilian Konrad is professor of political science at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. His main research interests include European integration and political theory, in particular issues connected to democracy, communication, civil society, and the public sphere. He is the principal investigator of the Horizon Europe project Reclaiming Liberal Democracy in the Post-Factual Age, Reclaim. François Forêt is professor of political science at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, where he is president of the Institut de Toutes Européennes. His research interests include European integration, collective values, identity and memory, symbolic legitimation of political orders, interaction between religion and politics, and comparative politics. Welcome to Making Sense of EU to both of you, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Let's start from the beginning. Can we speak about a European story? This is part of some of the debates we heard about in, in CES. Is there a narrative that allows us to understand who Europeans are? I think the, the question that we need to ask, though, is if the traditional narrative of European integration is still relevant uh, in today's uh, society or in today's circumstances. And this is, of course... Not something that I'm saying, but I mean, there, there has been this, this new narrative for Europe initiative a couple of years ago, and that's also been researched quite a bit, basically with the implication that, you know, the traditional storyline or the traditional narrative of European integration isn't really, doesn't capture people anymore. Because, I mean, this, this idea of Europe, or actually maybe, maybe it should capture people more again now, because, I mean... For the longest time, the, the narrative of Europe was that it's a peace project. I mean, that we have the European Union and European integration to thank for the fact that we have, that we're living in a very stable and peaceful environment. Of course, I mean... In the current context... In the current context, I mean, of course, we can question that. But I mean, there is certainly something to be said about... I mean, European integration needing some kind of narrative that explains to people what the whole project is about beyond this peace building by economic means. Everything is a matter of scale, uh, as usual. If we are speaking of uh, the societal scale, I'm not sure that there was any single narrative, never, because you don't have a single history, a single historical way to relate to European integration. So to this extent, what we are uh, living now is maybe not so new. Uh, Europe has always been a fuzzy and multiple object. And uh, maybe to take the long durée, huh, the, to take the historical uh, perspective, is also a way not to minimize huh, the challenges we are uh, confronting now, but just to remember that when the debate was uh, between, uh, let's say, uh, communist Europe versus Christian democratic Europe, even at national level, the phenomenon of polarization was uh, at least as important as today. So now if we come back to the institutional sphere and to this attempt to produce uh, discourses, of course, it may be a different question. So coming back to this idea of the institutional side, the European Union has worked hard and not always successfully in creating a common EU story, as you mentioned. One of the latest efforts being the European way of life narrative that you worked on uh, during the CES conference. Is it possible to construct such a story? There have been top-down efforts, bottom-up efforts with surveys and um, citizen consultation. Is it actually achievable to create a common story for Europeans? I wrote an article a couple of years ago in relation to this kind of new narrative uh, initiative, 
it took as a starting point the question of, I mean, um, in, the, in the literature on Euroscepticism. And basically, the question I was asking was, what kind of narratives of an alternative Europe or of another Europe are civil society or grassroots organizations trying to portray? And I think this is a very kind of an important aspect in this discussion because, I mean, I mean, that's not, not necessarily a top-down versus bottom-up perspective only, or at least that's, that's not the only dimension here. Because, I mean, you also see this playing out in very different ways in relation to where different organizations or different people stand on European integration, what kind of European integration they would actually like to see. There are plenty of bottom-up efforts, and not all of them are supporting supranational integration. Not all of them are supporting what they would portray as a, a neoliberal Europe and things like this, or market integration. So I think this is a, a very complicated question. So we might come back to what you mentioned before. Maybe there are several tracks, several stories happening and being built at the same time, and they need to coexist in a way. Sure, you have also several versions of the same narrative, and you mentioned uh, this example of the, the European way of life. Huh? Uh, it was understood by some as a exclusivist and ethnocultural discourse, huh? uh, especially because it was related to migration in uh, 2019, when uh, it became uh, the label of a portfolio uh, for uh, this president Chinas. For others, it was uh, perceived uh, simply as a neoliberal stance. Huh? Uh, yes, okay, way of life, but uh, related to mobility, to uh, consumption of uh, international cultural or material goods. But, so practices that uh, had also a socio-economic dimension, because not everybody is traveling, not everybody is interested in globalization, and some are more threatened than uh, protected by uh, the opening of borders. So this is an example among many uh, of the polysemic dimension of any narrative, because it has to, it has to be polysemic precisely to create unity, uh, unity in dissensus. What do you think as dissensus over liberal democracy gains traction in Europe which are possible avenues for dialogue of these different ways of seeing European integration or seeing the evolution of Europe? How can we talk to each other? There's certainly no simple solution or simple toolkit to say, well, we need to do this and that in order to start talking to one another again. But I mean, in matters of European integration, I think the most important thing is that we continue talking about what the EU is. And I mean, on the one hand, continue talking about what the EU is and what it does, but also spell out what it doesn't do. The question about liberal democracy is a much, much bigger one and probably much more difficult to tackle. Because I mean, there you need to ask yourself the question, what do you do in order to bring people back that have basically given up on the idea of liberal democracy? And I think it's important in that context to, to emphasize this, I mean, the liberal aspect of this, because, I mean, most people, I mean, even populists subscribe to some notion of democracy, but it's the liberal aspect that they take issue with. And that, I mean, that's essentially what we need to defend. And but, their I discourse mean, the is getting more and more sophisticated, too, on this alternative idea of what the EU can be or should be. Politics is more an art than a science, huh? and if it was a style in painting, probably it would be something between impressionism and pointillism. So this idea to search for a clear-cut divide between illiberal and liberal democracy is quite a challenge indeed. Maybe we should conceive this as a continuum. You have illiberal practices in liberal democracies, and you have indeed, as it was emphasized, still a democratic dimension in populist movements, at least in Europe. So we have to be probably modest also to assess the reality of the challenge, but also to consider that the European Union is not an island. So the question we are asking regarding the European Union, it's also, and even probably in a bigger dimension, it's also relevant at the national level. The European Union is just a superstructure that probably uh, maximize the societal trends. So that's why maybe we should brief a bit and uh, address uh, this issue at the level of the European multi-level governance. And uh, grassroots politics and top-down policies are necessarily connected. It will not be a solution coming from Brussels. That's probably the worst option. Uh, and all of these narratives that we mentioned are probably a bit too general. Enfin, one size fits all. It does not work, especially in a uh, matter of legitimization. So let's just experiment. It is important that we have moderate positions, kind of middle ground positions that we don't get sucked into this idea of thinking it is either the one or the other. 
are you closer to this, then you have to move all the way over to that side. If you're closer to the other or if you sympathize with the other, then you have to move in that direction. I mean, everything in politics is or can be nuanced. Indeed, the middle ground is a promised land. Uh, you have to reach this zone of contact where you can uh, search for compromise. And of course, the curse of the European Union, probably compared to the national state, is that it's not embedded in cultures, in tradition, and compromise is not very exciting. It's a grey dimension of politics, it's necessary, but if we uh, come back to the strictly communicative dimension of politics, it's difficult to mobilize uh, uh, through negotiations and compromises that may soon for some compromissions. So that's probably the main challenge. Huh? You have to still uh, frame uh, big uh, purposes, probably, and Maybe you can find such purposes in environmental issues, in technological issues, but you have to incarnate after that. You have to communicate, to mobilize, maybe to find, to invent new forms of political charisma, still uh, within the rationalist paradigm of democracy. So disinformation has always been there in one way or the other. The um, social networks and technologies have made it even more impactful, but we're in a context now where the challenges posed by artificial intelligence are taking this to the next level. How do you see the context that we're in close to European elections and having this discussion about AI and disinformation at the same time? How do you see things evolve in this context? The technological dimension of, of disinformation is a moving target. So, I mean, we can, we can design research projects We need to look into social media, or we need to look into the, the role of bots, or we need to look at, you know, this and that that has come about as a consequence of technological innovations. But I mean, when we actually then start doing the research, we realize that artificial intelligence is now at a completely different level than it was three years ago, or even a year, or maybe even half a year ago. I mean, yeah, a year ago, we were talking about deep fakes, and now yeah, it seems that's so exactly. old. And um, I mean... One of the things that we're trying to do is take this into consideration. I mean, that this is a moving target and it's most likely going to be a moving target. It might even be a target that starts to move faster and faster. So maybe going back to basics can be <laughs> one of the things that we can think of because once you get the principles, it's, uh, with technology, it's always been like that. Once you know how to work with technology, the technology can change, but the basis, the values, if we can say it that way, are the same. The narratives that we want to achieve or the conversation that we want to start is the same. But yeah, I mean, I think we're actually seeing <laughs> a series of paradigm shifts. Like, I mean, I mean, Habermas had an article last year where he talked about the emergence of social media as in a sense, a revolutionary moment of the scope of the invention of the printing press, in the sense that, I mean, the printing press basically gave everyone the opportunity to be readers, and now the social media give everyone the opportunity to be authors, right? And, I mean, we're at a, in a sense, at a critical point, because with that role also comes great responsibility, and not everyone has learned to handle that responsibility. And, of course, I mean, then if we add... We're starting to delegate being authors to artificial intelligence. Exactly. I mean, then we're... Uh, I mean, then at least we get a sense of the scope of the potential problems that are inherent here. So if we go back to European elections, the upcoming elections, we might say that they're going to be a live test of how these conflicting narratives will interact and these conflicting actors... How do you see the impact of these different narratives, of this different liberal versus illiberal, with all the middle ground included, play out in the upcoming months? I would be tempted to say none as a matter of impact. No, seriously, but we know that European elections are second order elections. It does not mean that they are insignificant, but they are frequently secondary regarding national elections. For example, in Belgium, we have the privilege to have national, regional elections in competition with European ones. And if we are only focusing on narratives, the example of the European way of life will probably show once again that each term produces new narratives with usual range and limits of European communication. And again, it's not necessarily uh, abnormal because European institutions are one source among many and not the most powerful one uh, to produce meaning in politics. So European elections will be just a step in a normal democratic agenda, but probably no communicative revolution to be expected. <laughs> 
something that has always characterized European election campaigns is that how little is actually talked about European issues. How little actually um, narratives about what Europe is and does shape European election campaigns and how little they shape electoral decisions. So it's very difficult to say to what extent artificial intelligence is going to have an impact on that because um, I mean, to some extent being susceptible to buying into narratives that are created by artificial intelligence in some sense presupposes that you're actually interested in the subject matter, which in certain cases might not be the case. I mean, if you look at countries where participation in European Parliament elections is, is as low as 30, 40, 50 percent. So one last question to let you go. What are the topics that you are going to be looking into in the upcoming months as all these events unfold and as your projects progress? I mean, our project is, uh, is structured into seven different thematic areas, all of which are connected to different aspects of post-truth politics, misinformation, disinformation, um, developments in political culture and so on. We're going to need to uh, approach these different themes. And I think it would go probably beyond the time that we have to go into each and every one of those. And in your research, are you expanding on the European way of life? Looking at uh, the broader picture of narratives, we will uh, continue the exploration of uh, narratives, how they combine, how they overlap, uh, how they hybridize uh, the European way of life, of course, but also others. And in the background, uh, we indeed have this question, uh, are we ready now to die for Europe? Uh, that's uh, one of the narratives that is coming and that we have to, to address. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Maximilian Conrad and François Forêt, for helping us making sense of this really complex topics of narratives, disinformation, and, well, this crazy world we're living in. Thank you very much. Making sense of EU.